Good evening, and welcome to the University of Chicago's 28th annual Martin Luther King Jr. Commemoration Ceremony. My name is Claire Moore, and I am a fourth year student in the college and an aspiring community health advocate. I am honored to stand here in Rockefeller Chapel to join in the commemoration of the life of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, where he gave his first major address in the city of Chicago 62 years ago. In the two speeches that Dr. King gave at Rockefeller Chapel, he reminded his audience that every individual has a responsibility to work against injustice and discrimination. As I reflect upon this current political climate, almost 50 years after the assassination of Dr. King, I remember his words spoken in my birth city, Washington, DC. There comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe nor politic nor popular, but he must take it because conscience tells him it is right. There is an urgency now, as there was an urgency then, to stand up and fight for civil rights, to put aside our differences and fight for the rights of not only those who look like us or those in our orbit, but for the end of injustice for all people. Close to 50 years after his death, we find ourselves in a climate not unlike the civil rights era of the 1950s and 60s. Although we have come so far, this country is still so very divided on the basis of race, religion, class, and citizenship status. It is important to remember Dr. King's mission of peace, justice, and an unflagging push to help others, the mission for which he paid the ultimate price. It is for this mission why I work hard to push myself through school, why I endeavor to work for health access for the underrepresented and the marginalized. Dr. Martin Luther King spoke against staying silent at such a moment of upheaval, saying, history will have to records that the great tragedy of this period of social transition was not the strident clamor of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. We are in another period of social transformation, and it is sad that 50 years later, Dr. King's words still apply so poignantly to the current situation. Now is not the time to remain silent. Now is the time to raise up our voices so resoundingly that 50 years from now, we will truly be able to see change. As Dr. King said in his first address in Rockefeller Memorial Chapel, if you can't run, walk, if you can't walk, crawl, but keep moving forward. I challenge this audience to keep moving forward, to take the steps that you can, no matter how small, to stand upon the shoulders of those who came before us, to lift others as we climb, and work towards a better, more just society. Thank you all, and it is my pleasure to introduce the Chicago Children's Choir. Father's son, we 
death, the tears have been watered. We have come, treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out of the gloomy past, till now we stand at last, where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who hast brought us thus far on the way, Thou who hast by Thy might led us into the You may be seated. It's an absolute honor and privilege to stand before you all today and to invoke some words from the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The words I'm going to share with you today are the last words, the last part of the last speech that Dr. King gave before he was assassinated. And here he was speaking about a previous murder attempt upon him when a man stabbed him in the chest. And the doctor said that the knife came so close to his heart that if he had just sneezed, that he would have died. And during this time, when he was in the hospital, so many people sent him letters from all sorts of places. And he said that mostly he forgot the content of those letters, letters that he admitted. But there was one that stuck out to him. It was from a high school student. And ultimately, she just said to him, I'm so happy that you didn't sneeze. And the rest of his speech goes as followed. And I want to say tonight, I want to say tonight that I too am happy that I didn't sneeze. Because if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1960 when students all over the South started sitting in at lunch counters. And I knew that as they were sitting in, that they were really standing up for the best in the American dream and taking the whole nation back to those great wells of democracy, which were dug deep by the Founding Fathers in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1961, when we decided to take a ride for freedom and end segregation and interstate travel. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1962 when Negroes in Albany, Georgia decided to straighten their backs up. And whenever men and women straighten their backs up, they are going somewhere. Because a man cannot ride your back unless it's bent. If I had sneezed, if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1963 when the black people of Birmingham, Alabama aroused the conscience of this nation and brought into being the Civil Rights Bill. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have had the chance later that year in August to try to tell America about a dream I had had. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been down in Selma, Alabama to see the great movement there. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been in Memphis to see a community rally around those brothers and sisters who are suffering. I'm so happy, too, that I didn't sneeze. And they were telling me, and now it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter what happens now. I left Atlanta this morning, and as we got started on the plane, there were six of us. And the pilot said over the public address system, 
We're sorry for the delay, but we have the Dr. Martin Luther King on the plane. And to be sure that all the bags were checked, and to be sure that nothing would go wrong on the plane, we had to check out everything carefully. And we've had, had the plane protected and guarded all night. And then I got to Memphis. And some began to say threats or talk about the threats that were out. What would happen to me from some of our sick white brothers? Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned with that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. And I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm so happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man because mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Thank you.
Good evening, everyone. My name is Judy Hansen. I'm the Associate Artistic Director for the Chicago Children's Choir. And it is so appropriate that we're here tonight because the choir was founded in 1956 at the height of the Civil Rights Movement as a peaceful combat to the discord in our country. And it was founded just two blocks away here at the First Unitarian Church in Hyde Park by Reverend Christopher Moore. And if you look at these singers, I think they're living it. I think they're living it. I'd like to introduce Chloe Johnson, our president of our Singers Council. Ms. Chloe Johnson. Good evening, everyone. My name is Chloe Johnson. I am 17 years old, a senior at Limbloom Math and Science Academy, president of Singers Council, and this is my 10th and final year in the Chicago Children's Choir. <laughs> it is truly an honor to be here this evening. We are the Chicago Children's Choir's largest ensemble, Voice of Chicago, and we are a representation of 5,000 singers all across the city of Chicago. For those of you all who do not know, I think that the mission of the choir really ties into what Dr. King believed in. He had a dream that children from diverse backgrounds and all people would be able to join hands as brothers and sisters. And I think that on a day-to-day -day basis, the Chicago Children's Choir works all across the city of Chicago, uniting youth from different backgrounds to learn about culture and to coexist and to work together. So this evening, we will be continuing on with a piece called Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Around, which is a very significant anthem song during the civil rights movement that united millions of people singing for freedom. After that, we will sing Precious Lord, which was one of Dr. King's favorite hymns, and he would use it when he sought out inspiration. And following that, we will sing Peace, a, a song written by a Chicago choir called New Direction. Thank you so much.
Good evening. Uh, I'm Bob Zimmer. I'm president of the University of Chicago, and it's a great uh, pleasure for me 
to add my welcome to you to this uh, event here this evening in which, in which we celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, first, please thank me in uh, uh, recognizing once again the Chicago Children's Choir Voice of Chicago. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the presence here this evening of, uh, of a friend who has himself had an enormous impact on American life in the last half of the uh, 20th century and now into the first two decades of the uh, 20th, uh, 21st century, uh, uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson. Thank you for being here. So every year, uh, we gather here in Rockefeller Chapel, uh, the site of Dr. King's first major speech in Chicago in 1956, to remember him, his work, the principles he stood for, and his continued relevance today. This year marks the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's death, and this special anniversary offers us the opportunity to reflect on his enduring legacy as a great leader. Dr. King was a forceful advocate, not only for rights and freedom, but also for the importance of building a society that incorporated at its core diversity and inclusion. In other words, his vision was not only about the individual and the rights that each should enjoy, but about society as a whole and how it should function beyond the individual level. We see this duality in his vision in some of his most important work. His work on voting rights on one hand, a work perhaps uh, captured most vividly in the public imagination in the march from Selma to Montgomery. And on the other hand, his stirring I Have a Dream speech in which he speaks so forcefully and eloquently about what an inclusive society for our children might begin to look like. Following his lead, our society has taken some very important steps, both on individual rights and efforts to create a more inclusive society. But our responsibility and the need for our work in these areas is serious and ongoing. Uh, the most important thing to remember, uh, as Dr. King said, is that you must keep moving. And we have an obligation as a society to keep moving. In confronting the work of great leaders such as Dr. King, one should, one should always ask not just what they did and how we can celebrate it, but what we can learn from it. At the University of Chicago, we have tried to learn from this very duality of Dr. King's work. We have striven to empower individuals, very particularly our students, by dramatically expanding our financial offerings so that every college student is admitted without regard to family's financial situation and is offered a financial aid package that enables them to attend without loans. Uh, by expanding the number of African-American students, Hispanic students, and international students, and by creating a large set of internship opportunities around the world, a particularly important resource for students from low-income and underrepresented backgrounds, students who are the first in their family to attend college, and students who may be undocumented. This work falls into the line of Dr. King's work on expanding individual opportunities and rights. On the other hand, we have also striven to focus on Dr. King's exhortations to inclusiveness. We have worked with the active participation of faculty, students, and staff to build an inclusive social and academic environment on campus, and at the same time, to be partners with individuals and organizations from the South Side so that we can work together as partners to build our common community for the benefit of all. There are many members of these community organizations with which we have formed important partnerships who are here today, and I want to express my personal appreciation to them for our joint work together. I believe that the University of Chicago has come to understand that we are better at fulfilling our highest aspirations when we work to help all individuals to fulfill their highest potential and when we build inclusive communities, whether on our campus or with our many community partners 
here on the south side and indeed beyond. Nevertheless, as I indicated, as I began, there is much more work to do, and this is work that we all need to participate in, advancing together as a community. This afternoon, I had the privilege of conferring this year's Diversity Leadership Awards. These awards recognize university faculty, alumni, and staff members whose work embodies Dr. King's values. The 2018 Diversity Leadership Faculty Award recipient is Randolph N. Stone, Clinical Professor of Law and Director of the Criminal and Juvenile Justice Project Clinic. A major focus of Professor Stone's work has been reforming our criminal justice system, in particular advocating for fair sentencing for juvenile offenders. Professor Stone has inspired generations of emerging legal scholars and practitioners to rigorously scrutinize the justice system and utilize their abilities to help children and young adults facing criminal prosecution. As a leader, educator, and legal practitioner, he has had a positive impact on countless lives across the nation. The recipient of the 2018 Diversity Leadership Alumni Award is Sonny Fisher, who completed her master's degree at the School of Social Service Administration in 1982. Ms. Fisher is a leader and tireless advocate for individuals from marginalized backgrounds, helping to found and oversee several nonprofits dedicated to helping women and marginalized groups. Most recently, she played a role in establishing the National Public Housing Museum dedicated to preserving the stories of people who have lived in public housing communities and exploring the place of public housing communities in the broader context of American history and society. Uh, finally, our recipient for the 2018 Diversity Leadership Staff Award is Dr. Scott Cook of UChicago Medicine, the Deputy Director of the program Finding Answers, Solving Disparities Through Payment and Delivery System Reform. Dr. Cook has been a leader at UChicago Medicine and in the community implementing training initiatives designed to improve the patient experience for people from marginalized groups, including the LGBTQ community and minority groups. His life's work has been dedicated to reducing health disparities and improving health outcomes for members of traditionally underrepresented patient populations. Would our award winners please stand and be recognized? For Uh, thank you for your commitments to diversity and inclusion and to your contributions to both the uni university community and to society at large and for the inspiration that you provide to others. Now I have the pleasure of introducing this evening's keynote speaker, Dorothy Butler Gilliam. Uh, Ms. Gilliam is an American journalist who in 1961 earned the distinction of being the first African-American woman employed as a journalist at the Washington Post. In the course of her career, Ms. Gilliam has reported on key moments in the history of the civil rights movement, including the integration of Little Rock High School in 1957 and of the University of Mississippi in 1962. For more than 30 years, her stories in the Metro section focused on issues of education, politics, and race, during some of the most turbulent periods in the country's history. Ms. Gilliam has been a champion for diversity in the journalism industry, leading initiatives to increase the number of journalists from underrepresented populations and developing a breadth of perspectives and experience in the news media. In 1997, she created the Washington Post's Young Journalist Development Program which for 20 years offered mentorship and training opportunities to students at underserved high schools with the aim of bringing more, color, more people of color into the journalism industry. In 2007, Ms. Gilliam established the Prime Movers Media Program, a Knight Foundation-funded initiative designed to revitalize high school media programs at schools with a high percentage of students from underrepresented backgrounds. 
Since retiring from the Washington Post in 2003, she has served in a number of roles, including as a fellow at the Freedom Forum Media Studies Center at Columbia University, Harvard University's Institute of Politics, and the George Washington University's School of Media and Public Affairs. Her book, Trailblazer, a memoir by the first black woman reporter at the Washington Post, will be published in 2018. Following her address, Ms. Gilliam will engage in a discussion with her daughter, Melissa Gilliam, the Vice Provost for Academic Leadership, Advancement, and Diversity, Professor of Obstetrics and, Pedi and Pediatrics at UChicago Medicine, and founder of the Center for Interdisciplinary Inquiry and Innovation in Sexual and Reproductive Health. Now, please join me in welcoming Dorothy Butler Gilliam. I will join all the others who have said good evening. It's a really wonderful honor and pleasure to be in Chicago, to be celebrating this, this important occasion with the University of Chicago community and uh, to hear this wonderful Chicago Children's Choir. When I was first asked to uh, come and participate in this program, uh, and it was mentioned that I should talk about media and my role in it and civil rights, uh, I had to pause because you know, media is such a vast and co complex subject, even though it's all around us. Um, and also, just looking at the issue of civil rights uh, from my limited involvement in the, in the 1960s and the larger issues of diversity. They cover so much time, so many years. Um, but I wanted to also make certain tonight that I spent just a little bit of time uh, not only talking about those subjects, but also uh, focusing on one of the important issues that Dr. King cared so much about, and that was the issue of poverty. So, and, and I hope that I can also leave you, uh, each of you, uh, with an, a, a deep inner feeling that yes, there is something that I can do. I know we've heard it a lot tonight as I've listened to the other speakers that uh, uh, we all need to be involved, but I, I hope I can uh, touch a a chord within you that will help you say, uh, yes, there is something that I can do. I better put on my glasses for the rest of this. Um, as a journalist, I did cover and participate in covering two of the really seminal uh, events that helped prompt the passage of the public accommodations and the Voting Rights Acts. Uh, in my view, these were two of the most important pieces of legislation of the 20th century. I grew up in the segregated South. I faced the humiliation and the rejection with white and colored water fountains. But I was also in a rare situation in that both of my parents attended institutions of higher education. And I say rare not because it was necessary. There were so many African Americans who did not have that, that privilege, but who did great things. But it was uh, the fact that my father was a graduate of Hampton and Wilberforce universities, and my mother attended a normal school, which today would be probably called a community college or a junior college, put us in a, in a, a slightly different category. Uh, but all of us learned that education would be the key to help us overcome racial discrimination and to be successful. And we were being prepared not only to be successful in the African-American community, but in society as a whole. 
my family, my church, my teachers, my communities, all worked hard to prepare us young people to succeed in spite of the harshness of segregation. After the Montgomery bus boycott began in December 1955, I can almost still hear Dr. King's ringing words that we must have the moral courage to stand up for our rights. And this was a, these were new phrases that we were hearing, but it struck a deep chord within me. And I attended and graduated from Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri. And I graduated in 1957, I was 20 years old. I tried to get a job at a daily newspaper, but none would hire me because daily newspapers and television were rigidly segregated at that time. I went to work for a black weekly in Memphis, Tennessee called the Tri-State Defender. My boss was a man named L. Alex Wilson. He was the editor of the paper. He was a veteran of having reported so much of the civil rights movement, so many of the stories that had, been, had not gotten wide attention, but they had gotten the kind of attention that a lot of black journalists were paying. And Mr. Wilson was very respected by that uh, band of black reporters who shared what was really a very dangerous beat in the South. This band included uh, Clert, Clotty Murdoch of Ebony Magazine, Francis Mitchell, Mark Crawford of Jet Magazine, Simeon Booker, Larry Still of Jet's Washington Bureau, and uh, many others. So my boss, Mr. Wilson, ran our paper, and he wrote many stories. And he, one of the stories that he was covering was the school integration story in Little Rock, Arkansas. Desegregation in Little Rock had been carefully planned, and it was expected to go smoothly. Uh, there were nine hand-picked, cream of the crop, black children, ages 14 to 16, including my now dear friend in Washington, Ernest Green, who is father of your professor, uh, Adam Green. But instead, it, it did not go smoothly. It became a showdown over state rights. And my boss, Mr. Wilson, he headed to Little Rock, and he left me back in Memphis. He said, you're only 20, you're a girl, it's dangerous, you don't need to go. And he was right, I was a total rookie. But it turned out that it was dangerous for him too. Because Mr. Wilson was part of a group of African American reporters that a mob of about 50 white men attacked. I watched what happened, I watched the attack on this little black and white television in our office on Beale Street in Memphis. And I just couldn't believe that my dignified boss was being attacked and beaten and um, the, uh, you know, a brick was hit, hit him directly in the back of his head. He was being pummeled and shoveled and taunted. And, and I wasn't surprised about one thing about Alex Wilson. He refused to run. They kicked him and attacked him, and still he refused to run. And even when that brick actually hit him on the back of the head, well, I was spurred to action. I had to go to Little Rock. So I called a photographer named Ernest Withers. He was a freelance photographer and said, let's go to Little Rock this evening. And he said, okay. And he, he warned me that it might be dangerous, but you know, I just didn't think of it. I just said, we've got to go to Little Rock. And so we drove directly to the home of uh, Daisy Bates, who was leader of the local NAACP who ran it, and her husband, L.C. Bates, who ran an influential newspaper. And Mr. Wilson looked at me and barked at, at Withers, and he said, why'd you bring that girl over here? And, and the photographer, Will, 
Withers looked at me squarely, and then he looked back at him, and he said, it was her idea. And it was my idea. Um, so the next day, I was able uh, to cover the arrival of some of the troops that pre President Eisenhower had sent in. And, but the main thing, I won't go into all the details of that. It's an old story. You know about the integration of Little Rock. But what I learned was these, that these veteran journalists um, who had been for years, many of them, stealing into the South at night, and they, they knew that if they were caught, they could be lynched. And some of them would take their old, uh, you, some of you young people haven't heard of this, but an old um, typewriter, you know, and uh, they'd wrap it in, you know, uh, even sometimes clothing, anything to make it look like they were just covering, uh, you know, they were just carrying a, a pack of clothes and it would be their typewriter on which they'd write their story. Uh, some of them actually um, uh, pretended uh, they were ministers and they had a Bible and they had their notebooks. Uh, others of them uh, pretended to be workmen. Uh, they had to work, I saw firsthand the crucial role that black reporters played in the civil rights movement because they were getting the story out. That was before the white press kind of discovered civil rights movement. But of course, uh, the white press came out and really, really was important in covering um, the civil rights movement. But Dr. King also understood that it was crucial that the media was involved because they had to get the story out. That's the only way the, this cotton curtain could be ripped apart and that people could actually see what had been happening for decades to black people in the South. Um, I was fortunate to get a, a job after the Tri-State Defender at Jet Magazine, so I actually lived in Chicago from late 1957 to um, early September of 1960. And I again continued to meet a lot of um, important reporters uh, covering the race beat in, in the South. And I think many of you who remember Jet and who know about Jet, the, the paper Jet, uh, it, was, it, was one, it was the picture of Emmett Till that was carried in Jet. That was one of the seminal moments, one of the horrifying events and moments that ignited the civil rights movement. So I learned so much when I lived in Chicago and, and worked for uh, John, uh, John H. Johnson. Um, I met uh, and became friends with Tom M. Boyer, who was the charismatic Kenyan labor leader and freedom fighter. Uh, but my dream had always been to work for a daily newspaper. And Dr. King was urging young people, you know, go into white corporations, make a difference. So I applied to Columbia University, but then I was told that my black college uh, didn't give me the credentials I needed. So what was I going to do? Uh, my, my journalist friend Samuel Yet, uh, who would later write a book called The Choice, The I Issue of Black Survival in America, he had taken a job in, at Tuskegee Institute, and he invited me to come and work with him at Tuskegee and get the liberal arts hours that I needed. So with that, I was able to enter Columbia in 1960. And after I graduated, um, I was fortunate to have an interview with the Washington Post. But the city editor, Ben Gilbert, just did not think I had enough daily newspaper experience. He said, go to a small paper, get some experience, and then come back but I also had a scholarship to go to Africa that summer after I graduated from Columbia. And um, I asked if I might send some stories so they could see that maybe I could write. And I did travel to Africa and, you know, I, it, it really expanded my vision beyond that kind of feudal caste system of Jim Crow in which I had lived all my life. Uh, in Nigeria, uh, I saw people in leadership positions that people of my race were denied in the United States. I would travel to Africa. I met 
I met Jomo Kenyatta that summer. He was being released from Gatundu. Uh, I met Emperor Haile Selassie. All of those things were, were shaping me in a way I hadn't anticipated. And uh, the, the article was I wrote from Africa kind of uh, proved to the Washington Post that I could write a little bit. And so when I returned from Africa, I was hired by the Post as um, the first African-American woman journalist. Uh, there were only a handful of black reporters in daily newspapers at that time. Uh, that was October 1961. And uh, Washington, D.C. was also a very segregated southern city. Um, it was tough for me just getting taxis to stop for me so I could cover my assignments. Um, I was once mistaken for a maid when I uh, and told to go around to the back door when, when I went to cover a general assignment event, uh, which of course I did not. But I did persevere. I knew that if I failed, it would be tougher for the next black woman to be hired by a major daily newspaper. And um, I still remember my most memorable early assignment was when the same city editor who helped to hire me, Ben Gilbert, selected me to help cover the integration of the University of Mississippi in 1962. Uh, and as a journalist, I was anxious to have a part in this big civil rights story. And I had met some of the, the African-American um, journalists who had been covering these, this subject. But I was definitely nervous about going to Mississippi. Uh, uh, black life in Mississippi was cheap. A, it was a, a culture of unrestrained violence against blacks just flourished. And nearly half the citizens of Mississippi had never voted, could not vote. But there was one brave man who decided to risk death to change the laws. His name was James Meredith. In 1962, Meredith, uh, with his federal escorts, finally, after three attempts, got onto the campus of the University of Mississippi. And his uh, presence started a riot. It was a total riot. Two persons were killed on that campus. And most of the black reporters and photographers couldn't get onto the, to the uh, cam campus, couldn't get into good positions to actually cover the story in Oxford. But once he registered and the troops came and they were in place, they, they could finally, we could finally get uh, close enough to report the story. Uh, one of the challenges for black journalists uh, in the South was where to sleep after, because the hotels were all segregated. And uh, Oxford was a relatively small town and had a small black population, but uh, the photographer, uh, Ernest Withers, and I said, let's go to the funeral home. And so I was able to stay at the black funeral home. And uh, this, this was the, um, you know, that was one place we would always go because there was, they always had a lot of information, but uh, I didn't really enjoy staying at the funeral home. Uh, and uh, I was very glad the next morning that all was well. Uh, the first story I wrote from Mississippi was headlined, Mississippi Negroes are happily stunned by Meredith. I think it's hard for the people today to, to realize the depth of the, of the of the fear in, uh, in Mississippi uh, and, and what, a, what a place apart it was. Uh, but these, these people in the city that I interviewed were so happy that this young man had made such a difference and that, um, they were, that his sheer bravery uh, just gave them so much joy and hope for the future. Uh, I, and that I also interviewed Medgar Evers while I was there. He was the field secretary for the NAACP in Mississippi. And um, 
even though there had been a riot and two people had been killed and there were troops all around the, the, the university, he was telling me the next steps that would be taken to get other African Americans to apply to state schools in Mississippi. He was such an incredible hero. But unfortunately, eight months after our interview, he was assassinated outside his home on June 12, 1963. He was 37 years old, and so he was a heroic martyr to the cause of freedom. Now, I tell you these stories to demonstrate that my own opportunities have come from being courageous against sometimes pretty big odds. Uh, having allies, that's important. And really believing deep within that racial equality, diversity and inclusion are worth fighting for. And I, I just hope that you will incorporate some of those same qualities, and I'm speaking particularly to uh, young people as well as not so young people, uh, but you can incorporate some of those qualities into your own fight for justice, because I feel in that way they will definitely honor Dr. Martin Luther King. Now, the, these experiences of my generation really helped to pave the way for opportunities for the next generation. And I could not come to Chicago and fail to speak of the huge contributions. Another person of my generation, Reverend Jesse Jackson, uh, really made to the advancement of black Americans. And I really also want to applaud the contributions he continues to make. I met Reverend Jackson in the 1970s after I had become an editor at the Washington Post. And I wrote about him extensively uh, in the, in the uh, 1980s and 90s uh, when I had become a columnist. Uh, and when he ran for president, uh, he was one that I kept a, a sharp eye on. He ran for president of the United States, as you know, in 1984 and 1988. And I, dearly, I deeply believe that his run for president helped awaken black voters across America to their potential and paved the way for that day on January 20, 2008, when the headlines re read, Obama takes over. I joined the throngs at the inauguration of this young man from Chicago, and you know he made history. He prompted so many of you, I'm sure in this audience, to, to wear those buttons that said, yes, we did. Yes, we did. And then again in 2012, we could say, we did it again. But I think that it, had it not been for the run of Jesse Jackson and, and um, he has many stories himself, I'm sure, to tell, and we'll do that. But uh, it, would, it, it really paved the way uh, for uh, President Barack Obama. And I know that Dr. King would have celebrated the election of our first African-American president. Uh, his incredible... Uh, impact, his accomplishments, all of these um, have made a difference in America, especially uh, for those Americans who now have health insurance. Uh, I'm going to be trying to close this up quickly, uh, but uh, I, as I mastered the skills of my trade, I could turn my attention to the issue of diversity. Um, Diversity in the media is essential, because how else can we change that narrative on the, on the abilities and the value of black and brown people? But I'm sad to say that the status of, of diversity now is not so good. When I first walked into the, the Washington Post in 1961, there were um, very few 
African Americans. Have, uh, did we make progress? Yes, we did. We, made, we, we definitely made progress. And one of the things that pushed us to make progress was this mantra that we always heard from white editors. They would say, we just can't find anyone qualified. Well, we knew that was not true. So we responded with action because although I was one of only three black reporters among hundreds in 1961, because of the civil rights movement, because of unfor the unfortunate assassination of Dr. King, because of the women's rights movement, all of these revolutions, uh, things were different in 1972. There were more African-American reporters, more women reporters. And um, so I was able to ban with other reporters and, and, and uh, take some action. We started training programs. Uh, I became a co-founder with eight others of the Maynard Institute for Journalism Education. And I, re I still sit on that board today. We started organizations, the National Association of Black Journalists, Hispanic Journalists, Asian American Journalists, Native American Journalists. Um, but our goal was to fight for change. Uh, we came together by the thousands in 1994 to voice our concerns. That was at a unity convention in Atlanta where all the people of color came together and, and said, um, you know, we, we need change because we want to have uh, the communities correctly and accurately portrayed. And uh, I'm pleased to say that Chicago's Vernon Jarrett was also uh, very involved in the diversity movement. We made progress. We had champions. We had a few champions among the white publishers and the editors, and we monitored the, the media pro uh, progress. But at the height of our diversity movement, the percentage of men and women of color was more than 20%. Now the numbers are dropping. The, in 2010, the American Society of News Editors, Editors reported that from 2001 to 2010, the number of African Americans in, in newsrooms dropped by 34%. That's almost 50% fewer. So at a time when the nation is more diverse than ever, the media is sliding backwards. And um, we all know that, that uh, the news media is in the midst of change. Uh, we are in the, we're in like a new century journalism now compared to what I was in at that point. But uh, it's very painful to me now that increasing numbers of minorities believe media does not accurately portray their communities. Because we've lost ground at a time when inclusion is more important than ever. And of course, further clouding the current media landscape is a president who deliberately attacks and undermines efforts at truth-telling with the moniker of fake news. What is fact and not fake is this. The media is more important now than ever in the current climate. As the Washington Post masthead states daily, democracy dies in darkness. Now, uh, the final stage of my career, and I really will speed this up, uh, but it has focused on the issue of young people. By starting the Young Journalist Development Program at the Washington Post, and by starting Prime Movers Media for high school students, I hope to give young people the gifts and the tools to make media, to tell their stories, their own stories, and make them hopeful for the future. So there's, there's a, a lot to say about that, but I, I just, in the interest of time, won't do it tonight. But it, it reminds me that I, I do need to talk about an element that I worked, when we worked with our young journalists, we tried to go into uh, urban communities, underserved communities, as well as some of the other 
uh, schools in the Washington Post circulation area. But I'm reminded that toward the end of his life, Dr. King stated that, quote, he said, the curse of poverty has no justification in our age. It is socially as cruel and blind as the practice of cannibalism at the dawn of civilization, when men ate each other because they had not yet learned to take food from the soil or to consume the abundant animal life around them. Dr. King continued, the time has come for us to civilize ourselves, to civilize ourselves, to civilize ourselves by the total, direct, and immediate abolition of poverty, end quote. Now, anthropologically, that quotation is questionable, but his message is absolutely clear and correct. The biggest pressure holding back people of color is still poverty. And the current administration's trickle-down approach will only increase the misery. Last year, for the first time in history, a majority of students qualified for a free school lunch, which is a, pro a proxy for student poverty. But abolishing poverty would do more to improve our schools and the issues facing African Americans and other people of color than any policy that would come out of the Department of Education. Why is that important? By denying our young people of color access to the classes, the resources, and teachers necessary to become productive, educated members of society, we are setting them up to fail. Instead of asking ourselves what is wrong in black and brown communities that, that we are not achieving more, we must ask ourselves what is wrong with us, the educated and the accomplished, that we have allowed for the continual denial of opportunities to our most disadvantaged youth. So how do we fix this enormous complex problem in our society? In terms of larger policy issues, we need to create what, what John H. Jackson, president and CEO of the Schott Foundation for Public Education calls, quote, an ecosystem, an ecosystem that fosters healthy living and learning environments. Now, I have read with great interest about the University of Chicago's Office of Civic Engagement, the three charter schools they've started, the admissions office work to increase the diversity of the student body. Uh, there are many programs through the medical center that certainly my daughter uh, shared with me about. But, but the important thing about those programs I was just naming uh, that are part of the University of Chicago is this is how an ecosystem work, works. A good ecosystem is like a multifaceted, holistic environment around students that promotes success by alleviating the pressures and issues, primarily poverty, that holds students back. And how do we do this? Clearly, we need to create good jobs with living wages for parents. Uh, we need to increase access to food and utilities for family. We need to end redlining practices that continue de facto segregation. We need to invest in community centers for after-school engagement. And secondly, the promise of available jobs after graduation creates hope for students. So we need to teach our youth that education pays off. While we certainly can tell them that a lack of education will hold them back, they need to believe deeply that having an education will move them forward. That, that is not shared uh, in many parts of Chicago and many parts of Washington where I live. 
in many parts of America. And these are huge problems that, that now face Mr. That, that face many youth. And uh, Dr. King, of course, cared about all communities and spoke of his concern about, about rural white poverty. Dr. Reverend Jackson was talking to me at the, behind the um, stage before we started about having been with Dr. King um, at one of his last meetings and when people, when, when whites and American Indians and people, so many people gathered because he knew that we had to think broadly about diversity and that's diversity across race, class, gender, ability status, uh, geography, uh, people on the West Coast are different from the people on the East Coast. But right now on the south side of Chicago, where the national media is filled with, with, with such negative images, I'm, I want to talk just a moment about African American youth. To help these youth, systemic changes need to occur. It can feel overwhelming, but there are actions that you and I can take as individuals to help fix these problems. First, listen to African-American people. We know what the problems are. Now, not all of African-Americans are going to be conversant in complex educational and economic policy issues, but we are more knowledgeable about our issues than many economic experts. Take the, mm -hmm. take the time to listen to our voices, our views, and our opinions. We are experts on ourselves. Second, Amplify African-American voices. Once you have taken the time to listen to what we have to say, help us speak our truth to power. Journalists do that. That's part of what the, the Washington Post offered me a platform to do that. Um, but we need to teach our youth that uh, they must speak out on their issues. They must speak out themselves on their own issues. We need to teach them that they deserve to be heard and that their voices can make change. Teaching this message is more than speaking to our youth. We need to show them through actions that their voices will be heard. So if you, for example, have access to a platform that Amer African American youth, youth do not, Think of ways you can use your position to help these youth access that platform. Offer, offering internships for them in your office, or even investing in young uh, community leaders, uh, encouraging some of them to go into politics. Third, get involved with organizations already doing the work, work such as Operation Push. Uh, such as national programs like My Brother's Keeper, uh, this program called Be Me, which provides African-American male mentors to, to youth. These programs are all doing great work to improve access and growth for our young people. It only takes a moment to look up the groups doing work. Uh, we know about Operation Push, but have we taken the time to engage or donate or volunteer. There is work to be done at the local level that each of us can do, and we can all do more than we think we can. I think that's one thing my career has taught me. We must, we can all do much more than we think we can. We must start where we are, use what we can, and not limit ourselves. You know, place no limitations on ourselves. And, and in that way, we will maximize our potential. So in closing, this time I'm really gonna close. <laughs> we know that 
an inclusive country is a strong country. A diverse country is a dynamic country. An inclusive country is an innovative country and one that is primed to prosper all of its people. So I call on you tonight. Don't be afraid of the African-American mind. Don't fear the power, the creativity and joy of the African-American intellect. We have always contributed to the strength of this nation since we gave 250 years of free labor. And we didn't do it happily. But we now have an opportunity to build up our youth so that they can create a stronger, better future for our nation. So if you really want to make America great, do not leave African-American youth behind. Do not believe those who are hungry for knowledge and bursting with promise. Do not leave behind those who are aching, who are striving, who are demanding a better future than what their parents, their grandparents, even their great-grandparents were offered. We know, yes, there is a crisis in America, crisis of poverty, crisis of inclusiveness. We've made progress, but we've we need to make more. But I really have faith that it is not too late to fix the course of our future. Forever onward. Thank you. So, Mom, first of all, thank you so much for being here and um, being in conversation with me. This is um, an opportunity for us at the University of Chicago to celebrate the wonderful staff, faculty, students, and community members that contribute so much to the institution. So it's really an honor to share this with you. I'll ask a few questions and then I'll open it to the audience and ask them to share in questions as well. Um, but I'd like you to begin by taking us back where you started uh, to the civil rights movement. You heard from Claire Moore, our uh, student, about how this moment in time right now compels her to do the important work that she's engaged in. And um, it's quite important work. She's a role model. But I'd like to hear from you you saw your boss getting beaten. You know that eventually he died young. What compelled you, as, we're, as we, many of us, are thinking, what do we do in this moment in time? What compelled you and Reverend Jackson and all the other very, very young leaders to be involved? Well, Reverend Jackson can probably speak best for himself. Um, but. Um, I think I would use the example of uh, James Meredith just briefly in terms of who was a young person who got involved in something quite dangerous. Um, one of the things was that he had been exposed, he, he was a veteran, and he had been exposed to um, living in places and situations where the harsh segregation of America was not practiced. And so he knew that there was a better way to, to live. There was a better way for him to live. Medgar Evers, who was also killed in Mississippi, was also a veteran. So I think the, uh, I know for me, uh, the exposure of, even in Africa, you know, in those early days of decolonization, uh, those, those, those days were, um, they were very important uh, for me to see myself in a larger way. And I always think of how uh, Congressman John Lewis talks about uh, uh, his own decision to, to, as he said, get in the way. Uh, not, 
it wasn't because his parents uh, were an example. Uh, it wasn't because um, um, he, it, it was a deep abiding um, uh, conviction that uh, they had to move to make change. And I think that, uh, you, you know, the exposure to other places, the, the, the knowledge that not all African Americans are Negroes, as they were called then, or blacks, were, uh, were, were treated uh, in other places the, the way they were treated in America. Um, all of this gave people uh, that, the moral courage that, that Dr. King um, uh, pushed us to have. The other thing was that Dr. Dr. King stressed that we have a power, you know, that individually we have a power. And uh, this was, uh, uh, this, this, this helped to, to magnify the, the individual's um, uh, understanding of, of how important uh, it was for them to be a part of this great revolution. And I, I think those are some of the reasons. Thank you. So um, there's a lot of attention now on The Post. There's a new movie, The Post. Um, and, but for me in academia, it's analogous to thinking about all of the many of us who are um, being educated in predominantly white institutions. Um, many of our uh, students, President Zimmer, talked about uh, the really important efforts being made by the admissions office to admit more uh, students of color and students from low-income backgrounds. Um, so I'd like you to talk about you know, what was it like to um, not only be a place where the, be at a place where there are very few black people, um, where there are very few women and nobody else who held both identities. Um, we talk here about imposter syndrome and how that feels sometimes. What did it feel like in what those- What kind of syndrome? It's called imposter syndrome. Oh, <laughs> yes, I've meeting. Heard of that one. It's a little, this sort of sense of insecurity mm -hmm. when you go into mm -hmm. these places. Mm -hmm. What did it feel like to be um, the only black woman in a very large organization? Mm. Well, it, it, when I graduated from Columbia, the, uh, uh, the professor told me, looked at me, and he said, you have so many handicaps, you'll probably make it. And um, it was quite a valedictory, I tell you, uh, uh, because, uh, you know, we all know the definition of a handicap is something, you know, that's perhaps separate from your person that is, is, is going to be affecting the impact you make. Um, so it, it, was, it, was very, it was very tough at times, and uh, I don't want to sound beleaguered here, but uh, the, uh, you know, the rejection hurt. I mean, there were you know, not only just the difficulties of getting around, you know, and, and still having the same uh, uh, expectations in, uh, that that they would have of white reporters of me, if I couldn't get a cab to get back and forth to the office, and, uh, then it made it just more difficult to do the work. Luckily, uh, I had attended a, a, a women's college for two years and learned shorthand. And so when I finally got a taxi, I could sit in the, in the back and you know, use my Greg shorthand to start writing, to, to start writing the story. So that when I got to the office, I didn't have to start from scratch. Um, but um, the rejection hurt. Rejection hurt. Uh, it, but uh, I am happy to say that by the 1970s, when there were more, you know, African Americans and people of color, more women. Uh, when I first went to the Post in 1961, the women were off in the women's page, uh, and. Uh, there were very few women who were on the city desk, who were on um, the national staff. Um, most, most of the women were, uh, you know, they did, they did some good reporting back there, but it was, it was um, you know, it was not, they were not part of, that, of the, the kind of uh, activity that you saw on the, in the movie The Post. So you mentioned that efforts to diversify the media were successful, but now faltering. 
Um, what are your thoughts about the current attack on the media and the prospects for diversity in the media? I think the current attacks on the media are very, very dangerous. I think they are dangerous internationally. Um, uh, the, uh, the American democracy has been a, uh, you know, a, a, a touchstone around the world. So when you have a president who makes the kinds of statements that are being made, uh, some of some things, you know, are tweeted and they, you know, they they are erased the next day or whatever. But it still has, uh, I think, I think it has a very uh, um, destabilizing effect on on the um, the American democracy internally and uh, throughout the world. Uh, I think it, it not only lowers the prestige, um, and, but, it, but it also uh, just raises questions in the minds of people around the world. So uh, a lot of people you know, say that, well, the media should just you know, not pay attention to the tweets and you know, disregard them, but it's just more serious than that. It's about the cumulative impact of this kind of uh, this kind of behavior, and there is so much, you know, turmoil in the world now uh, that that it only adds to that, um, you know, to that ongoing kind of earthquake-like disturbance that that is taking place. So, one of the one of the challenges you also mention is that there are just few there's just significantly less diversity in the media. Um, we have a project here led by uh, Professor Kathy Cohen called the Black Youth Project, and out of that comes the uh, project where the young people themselves are making media. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about ways in which people who are being disenfranchised and marginalized in the media are able to still get their voices heard? Well, um, right now we're we're kind of in the new century journalism. It's very different. Uh, it's in the process of, you know, what will be is in the process of, of being made. Uh, we know the. Uh, I think the Washington Post is one of the few daily newspapers uh, that has done any significant hiring in the last uh, last year or two. Uh, that's that's pretty significant. Uh, newspapers are continuing to uh, uh, reduce staff. Uh, they're being bought. I know the Chicago uh, Sun Times, I believe, has recently been bought, had new owners. Um, uh, newspapers are continuing to shrink, uh, you know, with buyouts and layoffs. Uh, but then, of course, we have the emergence of uh, you know readers having new reading habits, new readership habits, and also we have the emergence of social media in young people. And I've been uh, you know, espousing the importance of giving young people voices, and, they, and many of them have, uh, have certainly used social media to good effect. I think of uh, uh, you know, Black Twitter uh, did a lot of the on-the-ground uh, uh, exposure of br police brutality and continues to do that. Uh, Black Lives Matter, um, some of those, those important movements. So I think media is in the process now of, um, uh, of developing into what it's going to be. Uh, in many ways, media and technology are partners, uh, but uh, th they're just a, a, a lot of questions, a lot of challenges, and um, uh, I, I think the what is yet to come is certainly yet to be seen. Excuse the total cliche. <laughs> so I'll ask one more question, and of course, if anybody else would like to ask a question. Um, at the end of uh, your career, you spent your time um, developing programs to teach young people how to use the media to help them become uh, media makers and content makers. Would you recommend a career in journalism at this point? Um, I would not discourage someone who really strongly wanted a career in journalism because it is still so important to try to, uh, you know, to, to try to be a truth teller. Uh, it's so important 
uh, one of the things, we have a lot of bloggers, but a lot of the bloggers don't have the training uh, so that they can, can really, you know, um, um, separate truth from lie. You know, it takes a lot of, of, of training, a lot of uh, um, uh, development of expertise to really uh, 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 write uh, in a way that, that impacts people, impacts history. And um, I, think, I think we saw it in the movie The Post, because uh, you know, as the um, when it was time to really try to write the pa the story, um, you had to have a group of people who really understood all of the the history, et cetera. So um, basically, I wouldn't discourage anybody who really wanted to do it. I still personally try to mentor young people, but um, I would I would want them to really understand that it is a uh, it is it, it's. It's, it's becoming a, a new business. And, um, uh, it, and it, in many ways, it's more challenging than it was when I came along, because now a journalist has to be uh, very, his own photographer, his own uh, videographer, his own uh, 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 storyteller in so many different ways. We were fortunate enough to, you know, I had a photographer with me when I went to Mississippi. I had a photographer with me when I, you know, covered uh, so many of the events that I covered. Uh, but uh, now, uh, very often, the journalist has to do, except for the large papers like The Post and The New York Times and a few others, uh, a, a journalist has to do much more. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a more complicated career. So thank you again, and I love you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, please remain seated for just a few more minutes and uh, prepare to do some more applauding. Uh, I'm Bart Schultz, the director of the Civic Knowledge Project in the university's Office of Civic Engagement. I'm honored to be up here to add a few closing remarks. Uh, first, I would like to thank our distinguished speaker, uh, Dorothy Butler Gilliam, for the great inspiration, powerful insight that she has honored us with this evening. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, of course, her brilliant daughter, Dr. Melissa Gilliam, who's doing so much at our university to advance the causes of diversity and inclusion. It is very fitting that this evening we've had such an important and meaningful intergenerational conversation about issues that were so crucial to the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. As you've heard 50 years ago yesterday at the age of 39, Dr. King celebrated what was to be the last birthday of his life. 50 years ago, this coming April 4th, he was tragically assassinated in Memphis, where he had gone to support the cause of the sanitation workers who were protesting the unjust treatment that they were receiving. 50 years ago, there has been progress, certainly, as our distinguished speaker has noted, uh, but Dr. King's struggles, as she also noted, remain vitally relevant for new generations, uh, consider this passage from his work, The Trumpet of Conscience. This one really stands out for me. When an individual is no longer a true participant, when he no longer feels a sense of responsibility to his society, the content of democracy is emptied. When culture is degraded and vulgarity enthroned, when the social system does not build security but induces peril, inexorably the individual is impelled to pull away from a soulless society. Those words of warning should resonate today. Today it's very clear that we must strive together as much as ever to counter such demoralizing forces and recognize that, as Dr. King put it in his book, Strength to Love, in words that Coretta Scott King celebrated as at the heart of his philosophy, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. For the past 12 years, 
In my work with the Civic Knowledge Project, I've been blessed, very blessed, with the opportunity to help build community connections with so many brilliant individuals and organizations carrying on Dr. King's legacy. They are teaching me and indeed teaching us all so much about the importance of that legacy for this and future generations. Uh, the great, great Reverend Jesse Jackson, Sr. and Rainbow Push, we cannot honor this man enough for all he has done for our country and the world could ask for another round of applause for him. Please. Um, and it was Reverend Jackson and his wonderful colleague, Reverend Jeanette Wilson, uh, seated up here, please. Um, who urged us, who told me, you and others at the university, really need to do more this year to commemorate the life and work of Dr. King, to carry that work forward, and as always, they're right. It is in partnership with them that we're collaborating on the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Initiative, which you can read about uh, in your programs on page six. Saturdays at Rainbow Push, which is just over at 930 East 50th Street, are always special and inspirational. And um, we hope to see all of you there uh, engaging with the programs that this initiative uh, will be developing and, of course, the regular programs that Reverend Jackson is so well known for. We're also working with the indefatigable and dedicated Father Michael Flager in the Faith Community of St. Sabina. Father Flager will be here at the Center for Identity and Inclusion. Special thanks to them for this evening um, to talk about his experience, the meaning of Dr. Martin Luther King's philosophy for him. That will be on Thursday, January 25th, so please join us for that. And on Saturday, February 24th, we will be holding a public conversation and panel discussion on Dr. King's philosophy of nonviolent direct action with such friends as Reverend Damon Smith at Liberty Baptist Church in Bronzeville. One of the participants in that event uh, will be none other than our South Side elder, the senior statesman of Chicago's South Side, civil rights activist, and oral historian, and you Chicago alum, who will be celebrating his 100th birthday this December 7th. Of course, the amazing Dr. Tamuel D. Black. Uh, I'm not sure he's here with us this evening, but uh, yeah, we please give him another round of applause in absentia. Um, if, uh, if you want to catch a glimpse of what the beloved community that Dr. King Champion might look like, just join us for Professor Black's birthday celebration and you will get that opportunity. Uh, he is amazing. So uh, with that, another Round of thanks for everyone involved, the great speaker, her daughter, Melissa Gillian, uh, Reverend Jackson. Uh, and remember to join us for the MLK Initiative. More immediately, please head over uh, just next door to Ida Noyes Hall for a warm reception and some refreshments for both body and soul. Thank you so much for being here tonight.